Live truth, speak truth. This is the Jacob Kersey Program. Welcome to the Jacob Kersey Program. I am Jacob Kersey. Thanks so much for listening at Real Jacob Kersey on the socials. We're going to be talking to Kelvin Cochran about fighting the flames, both figuratively and literally. He has a very powerful story and testimony, and I'm just so honored and blessed to to know him and to have spoken with him, and and, um, I'm excited to talk with him on the podcast so you all can hear our conversation. But first, I just want to tell you about Romika Designs. Whether it's home decor, cutting boards, drinkware, you know, signs that you put up in your house, it's pretty fun when you have it personalized for you. You can dream it. They can probably make it. They do custom laser cuttings and engravings on almost all materials. Go to RomikaDesigns.com, R-O-M-I-K-A Designs.com, and if you click the link in the show notes, you will get 20% off RomikaDesigns.com. Kelvin Cochran is an author, former firefighter, fire chief, former U.S. fire administrator for the United States Fire Administration under President Obama, and he currently serves as a senior fellow and vice president of the Alliance Defending Freedom, and they defend the First Amendment and religious liberty. And in addition to that, Kelvin Cochran is is someone that I've just had the honor and, and pleasure to come to know personally. Kevin, uh, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and talking with me. It is my pleasure, Jacob. It's good to be on your your podcast. So you just overall, you have an incredible story and powerful testimony that has encouraged so many, and it had really it has encouraged me from the very beginning. Many uh, who are listening are are by now familiar with with my story, where I was effectively forced out of my job as a police officer, uh, January 17th, I, I resigned after being given an ultimatum, resign now or be terminated on, on their terms at some at some point. And, uh, you know, I left my job as a police officer because of my stance on marriage. I had made a statement saying that God created marriage. Um, he, God designed marriage. Marriage refers to Christ and his bride, the church. That's why there's no such thing as homosexual marriage. And uh, you have a similar story as well, but I, we're going to get to all that. But but first, I just want to start at, at the beginning. You you um you grew up in, in Louisiana as a young boy. You you, you grew up in in, in poverty. Uh, your your mother raised you, and I think you mentioned your five or, or six siblings. You had a relatively large family. So, uh, could you could you just share your your story as a young boy and 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 what led you to to want to be a firefighter at a, at a young age? Absolutely, Jacob. Um, I was born in Shreveport, Louisiana in the early 60s, and um, it was a very difficult time in our country. Um, At the time of my birth, uh, my mother had three sons, so I was the fourth child, and uh, my mom and dad uh, lived in a neighborhood called Allendale in Shreveport, Louisiana, in a government project's called Alameda Terrace. And so when I was brought home from the hospital, we were living in Alameda Terrace. And uh, a few years after my birth, two girls were added to our family. And my dad left my mother. Uh, He had some challenges. He was an alcoholic and he had another woman. And so he left my mother uh, with six children to raise all by herself. So we couldn't afford to live in the projects anymore. And my mother moved us a few blocks over, Jacob, to a back alley called Rear Snow Street. Uh, And we were living in a shotgun house. And uh, it was such a raggedy place. I remember it as a little boy, uh, four boys. We slept in one bed, Mm -hmm. uh, two at the top, two at the bottom. And uh, our two little sisters slept in another bed in the same room. They weren't nice beds like you would be familiar with, uh, and most people would be familiar with. There were old box springs and mattresses 
uh, stacked on cinder blocks with boards across the top of them to, to keep the boards, to keep the beds up. And uh, they would easily tumble. I mean, when my brothers and I would be wrestling in the bed, of course, when you got four boards in one small bed, wrestling matches are pretty commonplace. <laughs> and uh, that bed would tumble so easily, and we'd have to put it back together again. Uh, but we were very poor. My mother had to go on welfare and food stamps uh, to help take care of her children, and um, it still wasn't enough. We would always we, we would often run out of food by the end of the month. And I remember Jacob. Uh, sometimes my mama only had enough money to buy bread and mayonnaise and syrup, and so we would have mayonnaise sandwiches for lunch and dinner. And we would have toast with uh, Brer Rabbit syrup for breakfast. And all the sodas and Kool-Aid was gone by the end of the month. And so if we wanted something sweet to drink, we would put a few teaspoons of sugar in our in a cold glass of water and stir it up real good. And we'd have sugar water with our mayonnaise sandwiches. Poverty was a terrible thing. And uh, I realized that growing up as a little kid in Shreveport, Louisiana. But I guess another good part of that story is when my mother um, moved into that alley, she rededicated her life to Christ. Mm -hmm. And we joined the Galilee Baptist Church that was at the top of the alley. And we began to go to church uh, every time the doors was open. My mother had us in church. And um, it was at church, Jacob, that I saw men who were married men who had wives with children around me and my little sister's age and some kids, my big brother's age. Uh, and those married fam couples, they just seemed to be happier. The families that had a mom and a dad and uh, they were dressed nicer than we were dressed. And um, they just seemed to be in a lot better situation. And that's when I realized that God did not intend for a single mom to raise six children all by herself, but that that was God's plan for family. And uh, so in that alley, you know, being poor was something that stood out to me as a five-year-old little boy. And then, you know, seeing what God intended the family to be by looking at the men at Galilee Baptist Church was something that really stood out. But then the, the third thing I'll say is it was in that alley where after church one Sunday, uh, we heard sirens coming in through the alley and we opened the front door of our shotgun house. And right in front of our house was a big red Shreveport Fire Department fire truck. Miss Maddie, who lived across the street from us, our house was on fire. And when I saw those firefighters that day, Jacob, I looked at my mom and brothers and sisters and said, I want to be a fireman when I grow up. And, uh, and those were the three things that really, really stood out to me and that really, really were implanted in me as a little boy is I didn't want to be poor. I wanted a family like God intended, and I wanted to be a fireman. And the old the people used to ask us all the time, what do you want to be when you grow up? And my answers were always quick, and they were always the same. I would tell them, I don't want to be poor. I want a family, and I want to be a firefighter. And what they told us was that in the United States of America, all of our dreams would come true if we believe in and have faith in God, if we go to school and get a good education, if we respected grownups and treated other people like we wanted to be treated. They said, all your dreams are going to come true, and that's what I claimed to all my life. And they were right. All those dreams came true. Yeah, every every time you you talk about you know your experiences as a young boy, um, two things that really hit me, and and I guess they hit me because I relate. I I didn't um, grow up in in poverty uh, like like you did, but I did grow up in a broken home, and I did grow up with a with a love for first responders. And um, you know, one thing I I noticed is um, like you talked about when you would see you know, a family the way that, you know, God intended it to be. Um, you always, there's always that longing for, you know, that, that restored um, mm -hmm. vision of, of, of family. And and I think that has really stuck with me, especially as I've, you know, gotten involved and, um, and spoken out on, 
on cultural issues and political issues where there's just such a major attack on on the family unit and on family and we've gone so far from not just you know fathers being absent from the home but we we've gone so far in the opposite direction where um you know the very idea of of a family at, at all is is just is so foreign to young minds today and to to minds in general um mm-hmm. but but also you you talked about just this 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 uh desire as a young boy to want to be a be a fireman I, I remember as a kid growing up being in the in the broken home um there were law enforcement officers responding to the custody battle that was was going on concerning me as a kid okay mm-hmm. and so you know i the, i felt the same way when i saw you know the old crown vicks <laughs> pull yeah. up to to the house i every Every time we'd go out of the, the city I, I lived in, I would I would always say, you know, the other the other police department they their cars are better. They're my favorite yeah. police cars. And uh-huh. I uh, you know, Matchbox and Hot Wheel. Anytime I'd see, a, you know, a police car, um, I'd always want it. And I had so many, and I'd always play. And then I just remember, um, with with my brother, I, I we'd be on the floor, and he loved sporty cars you'd always get the sporty wild <laughs> hot wheels and i'd have the police cars and anytime we'd play cops and robbers with our matchbox hot wheel cars uh-huh. you know, he would say i won and i'd say you can't win because the good men always win because i, <laughs> I saw police officers as good men and I, I just grew up with with this you know since you know the, these officers they bring security and they bring stability to 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 chaos especially mm-hmm. in in my life so it really it really touched me and so those two aspects of your story have, have really touched me so so you became a firefighter eventually one day what what was you know what was going through your mind when when you you know went down and and you uh asked for a job or and and you got the job and you got to go and, and start training to be a firefighter what, what what did that feel like for you well, the first thing that dawned on me is uh, that those values that the grown-ups and my mom instilled in me growing up were absolutely true. They raised us on faith and patriotism is how I described it, and that the faith and patriotism that was instilled in me as a kid growing up in Shreveport actually caused my childhood dream to come true. And um, so when I actually became a firefighter in 1981 and began the recruit training academy uh at that point i felt my dream had come true but it was the starting point of a childhood dream come true uh fairy tale career but it didn't start off as a fairy tale it started out very challenging because i was one of the first african americans on the shreveport fire department and uh by and large, we were not well received. There were some of our white brothers who were very friendly and very welcoming. And most of those were predominantly the ones that I came through the academy with. And then some that were already out in the field. Uh, but we dealt with those of us who were the first African-Americans on the Shreveport Fire Department were under uh, just steady, uh, a steady flow of racial slurs, racial jokes, and stereotyping and you know it was very very difficult being called uh, names and statements made about you because of the color of your skin and having a designated bed for the black firefighter and Mm. uh, just it was very very difficult but uh, I never saw myself as a victim and I never saw myself as being defeated I embraced the role Uh, wholeheartedly. My focus was that I had um, a responsibility to demonstrate that I was just as capable and just as competent uh, as any person, that I loved the job as much as they did. And I just believed, Jacob, that it was just a matter of time before I demonstrated that to my colleagues that, you know, like Dr. Martin Luther King said, that, you know, that we would be judged by the Uh, content of our character and not the color of our skin. So it took a few years, uh, but eventually my performance and my commitment, uh, my love for the job and love for people um, overcame all of that. And, and you're like 
dedication and determination to the job and 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 ref- refusing to let the opinions of others prevent you uh from putting forth your best foot and and effort in in the job that you loved led you to just incredible um career <laughs> uh achievements and and I want to start with because you know you have three really incredible career achievements but you became the the chief a uh, fire chief there in in Shreveport, Louisiana, where you grow up. Um, what what was that journey like leading up to you know b- before you came the fire chief and when you became the fire chief? Uh, what was your experience there at, at in Shreveport, Louisiana? Yeah, um, that's a very good question. You know, the as a firefighter, we have to face a lot of fears in our profession, and um, you know, I never had a fear of, you know, fighting any type of fire or responding to, you know, shootings and um, multi-car vehicle crashes or a trench collapse. I never had fears of those kinds of things. My greatest fear in the fire service was a fear of incompetence. I was always afraid that I was out of being asked to do something that I was supposed to know how to do and then failed to do it. And so, um, I constantly studied and, and um, practiced to make sure that I was at the very top of my game. And that just fed my hunger for professional development in the early stages of my career, which was not consistent throughout the ranks. I mean, in, in the fire service, especially in those years, you know, um, you know, when once a firefighter, in many cases, learned enough to be safe and to keep their job, they were pretty much satisfied. Well, I, I wanted to know more than just enough. I wanted to know more than enough so that I could always be prepared to meet the needs of my crew and to meet the needs of my captain. So that hunger led me to uh, get promoted to uh, captain in the training division. So I began to train firefighters, and that was four years in. So after four years on the department, I became a captain in the training division. Uh, and then uh, in 2000, uh, 10 years in, I became an assistant chief. It usually takes about 12 to 15 years to become a captain. It usually takes about 22 to 25 years to become an assistant chief. And then in 18 years, I became the fire chief for the Shreveport Fire Department. But it was through a constant uh, hunger and pursuit of professional development in higher education um, that really equipped me to be qualified to serve in that capacity. And then after serving as, as the chief fire chief in, in Shreveport. And and as you mentioned, you did that, um, in a, in a time, you know, that breaks the, the average and and the expectations you were were really excelling at what you were doing in, in Shreveport. Then you, got an offer to, to be the fire chief in Atlanta here in my home state in in Georgia. Yes. I was 39 years old when I became fire chief in Shreveport. And then eight years later, uh, I was recruited to come and serve as the fire chief of the city of Atlanta under mayor Shirley Franklin was the mayor at the time I was appointed. And, uh, she had two years left in her second term, which was a, a, a tremendous career risk for me to come as an appointed position by the mayor, knowing that she only had two years left in her second term. But I just knew that God brought me to Atlanta and that he was going to be with me. And, um, and Mm -hmm. so it was a challenging two years because it was the beginning of the economic downturn. And as the new fire chief, I had to come in cutting 50, uh, excuse me, cutting $15 million dollars from an $86 million budget, which was very difficult and laying off firefighters who had just graduated from the recruit Academy, closing fire stations, shutting down ladder trucks. It was difficult, but as difficult as it was, it was the most uh, invigorating season of my fire service career. And two years into it, uh, just under two years into it, uh, president Barack Obama was elected uh, president and, uh, contacted me and, um, well, one of his staff members from the white house contacted me and, uh, indicated that the president wanted to appoint me to the United States fire administration. And of course I was honored to do so and went through a Senate confirmation process where 
I was unanimously confirmed by the United States Senate and uh, and served as the head of the United States Fire Administration for just under a year. The reason why I was such a short tenure is because the mayor who was elected following Mayor Shirley Franklin uh, never filled my position after I left, and uh, it was still vacant. And so uh, I was recruited by Mayor Kasim Reed to come back to Atlanta to resume my post as fire chief of the city of Atlanta. And uh, the president was kind enough to let me go and return to Atlanta. And I did, and I served Mayor Reed in the city of Atlanta faithfully for five years as fire chief. Do you think the young boy in Shreveport watching firemen enter a flaming house and watching the the fire truck would have ever dreamed that one day he would be serving in the highest fire service position available in the entire nation. Absolutely not. That I I can't even say that that was the furthest thing from my mind because my mind wasn't big enough to comprehend <laughs> such a thing. It really wasn't. Uh, it was. I mean, my highest joys was fulfilled when I graduated from the recruit academy as a, from the basic training academy as a firefighter. If that's hmm. if that was all that God had done for me, man, I would have been super super happy, uh, and had no idea that God had planned for me uh, to go as far as He had taken me and to accomplish all that I had accomplished from a childhood dream. Growing up with a single mom, six kids on welfare and food stamps, living in a shotgun house, um, that's truly an American dream story, a faith story, uh, a God-sized story, a story that only God can do in the life of one of his children. So even while you were fire chief, you were still involved in, in, in your church and, and in ministry. Um, you, I believe you, you said you were a part of a Sunday school class or teaching a Sunday school class or Bible study, something of that nature. And you uh, wrote a men's study, which became a book called Who Told You You Were Naked? Or I, I've heard you pronounce it naked. I, I think I know <laughs> I've heard South Georgians in, uh, in, in Louisiana uh, pronounce it that way. So yeah. what was, uh, tell me about th- this book that, that you created. What, what inspired the book? What was in the book? And how did this book change your life? Yeah, well, I had been so passionate about men's ministry for years, you know, growing up without a father and wanting to be a good husband and a good father to my uh, children and my wife and my children and just wanting to be a good example and a good role model as a biblical man. So I was teaching small group men study at Elizabeth Baptist Church, my church in Atlanta. And um, we were conducting a study on the quest for authentic manhood. And one of the lessons were on was on God's purpose for man. And um, it was in one of those sessions when I asked the men, about 12 guys, uh, are men today still suffering from the consequences of what Adam did in the Garden of Eden? And all 12 of them being Christian men said yes. So I asked each one of them to share why they felt that way. And each one to a person were talking about the challenges that men are still having in their in our carnal nature that they were personally having in their carnal nature and each time each guy finished sharing his his response that question that god asked adam in the garden of eden who told you that you were naked just kept repeating itself in my head and so after church that day i was on this quest jacob to find out why was god putting that question in my head and i i did a word study, began a word study on that whole question. And uh, it just led to a lot of content uh, about that question. Uh, God was asking Adam, I was curious as to whether God was asking Adam more than who told you that you don't have on any clothes. And sure enough, that question was bigger than who told you that you don't have on any clothes. In essence, and here's the short story. God was asking Adam, who told you that you were condemned and deprived? Mm. And uh, that's what naked actually means, condemned and deprived in that context. 
And uh, Adam never answered the question. And God wasn't satisfied. He wanted to bring uh, some restoration back to his creation of humankind. And so his Adam's solution of fig leaves didn't help. And God's solution was to kill an innocent lamb and to clothe them with coats of skin was the solution. So clothed, of course, is the opposite of naked. And in that context, clothed means redeemed and restored. And the scripture says in Galatians 3.27, those who have been baptized in Christ have been clothed with Christ. And uh, God spoke to me and said, you were talking to 12 men who were clothed men who are still acting like naked men. And I want you to share this message with men today and ask them the question that Adam never answered. And that is, who told you that you were naked? But in that book, I was dealing with some of the issues that those brothers brought up that day. And one of the issues, of course, was sexual sin. So to talk about sexual or sex in a biblical context, you have to go back to the book of Genesis, where God created them male and female, and the two were joined together in, as one flesh, and God gave them the divine assignment of multiplying. So procreation was provided to the male and the female in holy matrimony uh, for the purpose of procreation. And he made it enjoyable because he wanted them to have a bunch of kids and he wanted generations of, of sons and daughters. And that's another biblical precept that I brought out in the book. And that is in the family of God, there are only sons and daughters and that to have sex God's way, you have to do it in marriage and holy matrimony. And I expressed that in about three or four pages in that book. 162 page book and it was those four pages that drew the ire of an openly gay atlanta city council member who complained to the honorable mayor kasim reed about what the bible said uh regarding marriage and sexuality and i was initially suspended for 30 days and after the 30-day suspension jacob i was terminated from employment for writing that book and what i said uh, regarding marriage and sexuality. When you were first experiencing the, this fire that had uh, been ignited because of, of the content of your book, did, did the city of Atlanta give you options to apologize or recant your positions or, or bow the knee, or was there any possible way forward for you to keep your job there in Atlanta as far as they were concerned? Well, initially, the reason for the 30-day suspension, I was told, was to investigate my service in Atlanta to see if my views on marriage and sexuality had ever caused me to discriminate against anyone from the LGBT community. They, the, the Q and the a plus wasn't on it at that time. It was the LGBTQ, LGBT community. And uh, after the investigation, uh, I was completely exonerated. No person on the department or in the city government that I had worked with that was LGBT uh, ever had anything uh, but a good experience with me. Some of them said I was the most fair person that they had ever worked with. <clears throat> um, nevertheless, I was terminated anyway. Uh, but during the 30 day suspension, they, they, uh, before the 30 day suspension, they shared with me that um, if I did come back to work, <clears throat> that I was going to have to go through sensitivity training uh, to change my uh, perspective, you know, on what I had written in the book. And I share with them on the front end that sensitivity training, I'd be, if I came back, I'd be willing to go through it. But it certainly was not going to change my perspective on what I had written in the book because it was based upon biblical truth that I believe, Jacob, is uh, inerrant, infallible, immutable, and authoritative. And so sensitivity training wouldn't have any impact uh, on that. But uh, sadly... Um, 
even though I was exonerated from any wrongdoing, I was terminated. Um, well, before I was terminated, I was asked, given the option of resigning, uh, but uh, I chose not to resign because I would have acquiesced and um, and it would not have bode well for anyone else who believed the same thing that I believed that worked for the city of Atlanta or even the citizens of the city of Atlanta. So uh, because I didn't resign, I was immediately terminated. I did ask for an appeal to the honorable mayor because I had never spoken to him up to that point and wanted to appeal to him on the behalf that the investigation uh, didn't find any wrongdoings. And um, so I, I wanted to appeal to him in the sense of justice that I would keep my position. But the chief operating officer told me that that was not an option. That So I didn't have that opportunity. So after you, you were fired, you had a decision to make. Uh, were you going to continue standing for um, not – and as you mentioned, and, and I, I love this so much, it wasn't just you that you had in, in mind while you were going through this this trial. Um, you had others in mind, and, and I guess that's part of being a, a first responder is you know constantly with, with calls. You know, Other people are, are on your mind, and even during this trial that you were responding to, um, that you were forced to, to respond to, you, you had other people on your mind, so you, you – what what decision did you did you make going forward? How did you handle uh, being being fired, and and, and what was um, uh, the aftermath um, of, of that decision? Yeah, well, at the time of my termination, Jacob, you know how some people say, um, some people that have a near death experience say their life flashed before their eyes, and uh, being fired is not even close to a near death experience. But I did have the experience of my life flashing before my eyes. And uh, God showed me all the way back from my childhood poverty days how, you know, difficult it was, but he brought us out. Uh, He showed me in my um, troublesome youthful years, you know, how difficult those days were and how he brought me out. Uh, God showed me how the challenges I faced in the fire service in those early years, as difficult as they were how he brought me out and how in my terrible twenties, I was not following the path that my mother in the scripture taught me to follow. God preserved me and protected me and brought me out. He showed me the times when I was having difficulties in my marriage and how through pursuing him and staying committed to him, he brought me out. He just showed me seasons and ages and stages of my life. He's always been there and he's always brought me out. And how all things always work together for good. Mm. And I realized in that moment, Jacob, that God had been preparing me for that day of termination my entire life and that he was with me there. You know, there comes a time in the, in the, in the walk of our faith as a believer that we're going to have to make a choice as to whether we really believe that God is who he says he is and that he is a protector when we face sufferings. One of the scriptures that really uh, drove my spirit through this whole fiery trial is in uh, Second Peter, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12 through 14. It says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. And I realized that the sufferings that I was about to endure had nothing to do with what I had done. It had everything to do with God choosing me to endure that fiery trial uh, for his glory. I've discovered, Jacob, that suffering for the name of Christ and standing for truth is not a punishment. It's a privilege. God God handpicks those people 
Even in the Bible, God handpicked Job, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Daniel, Joseph, Esther, Mordecai. It's a privilege to be chosen by God to endure persecution. And I'm praying and trust that by now you've experienced that for yourself. Amen. And and one thing that, that sticks in my mind and has been in my mind, you know, all year long is early on in, in the book of Acts, we see the apostles are, are flogged for their uh, teaching, um, for proclaiming Christ, for preaching the gospel. And they left the presence of the ones that had flogged them rejoicing because Scripture says they rejoiced because they were counted worthy to suffer for his name. Yeah, and it's it's can be a, it can be a hard thing to do to to rejoice when when all your 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 dreams as far as you know your what you, what your your flesh what what you desire in this life when all that can can be crumbling and before your eyes withering before your eyes but you know you when you experience a treasure that is far greater that you cherish far more and love and desire more mm-hmm. than anything of this world yeah then you're you're able to to rejoice and and Calvin I I know you and I would 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 agree that the persecutions that that you and I have have experienced in in America are nowhere near uh what what has what takes place in the lives of believers in other countries or even have historically in the church I mean we read of believers uh, b- b- both past and present who are beheaded for their faith or shot do- down or gunned down or you know murdered in horrific ways for their faith and in America we haven't reached that level yet but but I'm amazed that um you know at, at, at where we're at currently our jobs are at risk you know our lives aren't at, at risk but our jobs are and you and I have both experienced that the moment that we profess Christ and his teachings our jobs are at risk and yet so many Christians are unwilling to be vocal and they're they're silent and and you have said the redeemed of the lord are afraid to say so what what is what do you see yeah as far as the, the, the state of American Christianity and, and the willingness to, to, to stand for Christ, what what needs to happen and, and what is your encouragement to someone listening who says, you know, Kelvin, I'm I'm worried that, that I don't have what it takes to, to stand for Christ at, at my workplace or among my friends? Yeah, well, very good question. It is it's an occupational hazard to be openly Christian. Christian in the United States of America today. There's absolutely no doubt about it but as believers uh in christ and uh you know as faithful sons and daughters of god we should be encouraged by god's testimonies in the scripture the men and women in the scripture who have endured persecution and suffering and look out how their lives turned out because they were faithful enough to endure because we serve the same god uh, that took care of them. He is the same God who is taking care of us. Uh, and those names that I just gave, Job and Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Esther, Ruth, Mordecai. I mean, you, the list goes on and on and on. A living proof of the faithfulness of God, or proof of the faithfulness of God. And there are saints today who are living proof of the faithfulness of God. And by the grace of God, I'm one of them. But there are five things that that I've learned that God has shared with me, given me to share with other believers so that they will have the courage and grace to stand. And I'll just briefly mention them quickly. If your listeners want to get more details, certainly they can um, order my book. This is not a shame. I guess uh, I, I don't even call this a shameless plug to order my book. I'm not a salesman. I didn't write it for that. But the book that I recently wrote, um, Facing the Fire, they can get a lot of detail uh, on how to have the courage and grace to stand. But the first thing I learned is that God always prepares his sons and daughters for persecution, that we wouldn't be going through it, Jacob, uh, if God had not determined that we were prepared for it. So that's a good lesson to know that if you're going through it, you know God has determined that you're strong enough to endure it. The second lesson is the toughest lesson, 
And that is there are worldly consequences for standing on biblical truth and standing for Christ. And uh, you mentioned that there are, are believers in other countries who are facing far greater consequences uh, being beheaded like those 21 Christian Egyptians did about seven years ago. Their children being killed, the Christians in Afghanistan for not rejecting Jesus Christ. And the 125 college kids in northern Kenya who were killed because they refused to reject Jesus Christ. And so they're facing, they're, they're believers, and we don't hear those stories, the stories of Christians who are rejected from their families if they convert from Christianity to being, uh, from, from being Muslim or Buddhist or Jewish to become a Christian. They're just banished from their family. Some are immediately put in jail, you know, because they confess, have a public confession of Christ. And I ask God, why in the world has he not allowed American believers to experience those kinds of consequences, Jacob? And the answer is simple. God said, my American kids ain't strong enough to handle those kinds of tests. And he's right because we have American believers who have the same God, the same Christ, who won't stand for Jesus because they're afraid they're going to lose their job or they're going to lose their election or they're going to lose a boyfriend or a girlfriend. So we're not prepared for those kinds of tests. But if we continue to be cowardly and silent, one day our grandchildren or great-grandchildren can live in a country where they face those kinds of tests. The third thing I learned is that even though there are worldly consequences for standing on biblical truth and standing for Christ, which is number two, the third thing is there are kingdom consequences for standing on biblical truth and standing for Christ. And the kingdom consequences are always greater than the worldly consequences. The fourth thing I learned is that uh, God is glorified when sons and daughters have the courage to stand. Uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is a good example of that, where King Nebuchadnezzar made a decree after he brought them out of the fiery furnace. No one should worship any other God but the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So when we stand in the face of persecution before our enemies, our enemies get to see a side of God that they would have not seen Mm. if we would have bowed down. And then the fifth thing I learned is when we stand, Jacob, our life of blessing goes exceeding abundantly above all we could have ever asked or thought. Job was restored twice as much as he lost. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego became governors in Babylon once they were brought out of the fiery furnace. Daniel became a prime minister. Esther inherited the estate of Haman, the guy who was trying to kill all the Jews. Mordecai became a prime minister of the Medes and Persia. Because of all the sufferings that Joseph went through, he became a prime minister of Egypt. I mean, Jesus went through his suffering and now has the name above every name. Every time we have the courage to stand on the faithfulness of God, our life of blessing goes to another level. That's my story. I don't have time to tell you what God has done, but my life now is on a level that is exceeding abundantly above all I could have ever asked or think, far greater than if I, my plan would have been executed to, to work three more years and then retire. There's no way I can live this life of joy and blessing and contribution to the body of Christ that I'm living in today had I just simply worked out my years and retired. There's no comparison. So God is faithful. And I just want to encourage those who are listening, you know, that that Jesus said it this way, whatever you lose standing for me, I will restore it 100 fold in this life with persecution. So the persecution is not going to stop. So we've got to learn how to rejoice in it. And then it says after this eternal life. And so, you know, we, we, we are hanging on to stuff that we think has a greater value when God wants to replace it with something a hundred times greater. Uh, But if we don't have the courage to stand, we'll never see what the 100 fold blessing actually looks like. And Jacob, I want to encourage you, man, in that regard, you lost your, career, your job as a police officer, but God has something 100 times greater 
uh, for you in store. You just have to stay in there, stay focused, stay faithful, and stay humble in the promises of God. You're going to be living proof that the promises of God are true. Thank you so much, Kelvin, for for your encouragement to the audience, your your encouragement to me, uh, your story from from day one when this happened. Someone texted me and asked me if I heard about you, and I immediately looked into your story and was just blessed. Years later, after it happened, like your story impacted me in a very real sense uh, this year. And, and so, thank you so much. It's an honor to have you on, Kelvin Cochran, former fire chief and current. Uh, Senior Fellow and Vice President of the Alliance Defending Freedom. Thanks so much for joining me on the podcast. Uh, It's my pleasure, Jacob. And I'd be remiss if I didn't share that part of the story when I was fired. You know, this Christian law firm that I never knew existed came alongside me, took on my case, and after a four-year legal journey, vindicated me. The city of Atlanta had to pay a significant settlement and if that's not good enough, they hired me to be a part of the team. That's just part of that hundredfold blessing story that Jesus promised. Amen and amen. Thank you so much, Calvin, for coming on today. I really appreciate it. You're welcome, Jacob. And God bless you, man. I can't wait to see uh, the rest of your story. If you'd like to get a copy of Kevin Cochran's new book, highly encourage you to check out the show notes if you're listening to the podcast. Facing the Fire, the faith that brought America's fire chief through the flames of persecution is a great read. I have personally been blessed by it, and I know you will be too. And if you enjoyed this conversation, I highly encourage you to go check out that book to hear more of Kelvin Cochran's story and his wisdom. And he imparts it so well in the book. When I was told that I was being placed on administrative leave pending my termination at the police department, I had messaged some mentors um, informing them of the situation, asking them to pray. And honestly, I was blindsided by it all. I never would have thought that I would um, be put in a situation like that at my workplace. Um, I've never worked in, at least I thought, never worked in an environment that was hostile to my Christian faith. I've never really experienced um, people treating me differently because I was a Christian. I've never treated people differently be, um, as, as a Christian or because they weren't Christians. Um, I've always gotten along very well with with my coworkers, and uh, things were going extremely well at my former police department. My command staff there seemed to love me, and my coworkers seemed to enjoy working with me, and then I learned a lot, and uh, I was I tried to ensure that I always thanked someone for spending time to, to teach me um, whatever it is they, they had spent the time going over with me. I was kind of blindsided, When someone complained on a statement I made off-duty about my Christian beliefs in marriage, and um, I was placed on administrative leave, told I could very well be fired um, for not recanting my statement. And someone sent me a text message to tell me about Kelvin Cochran that day. I looked him up, Googled him, (laughs) and... God works in amazing ways, and sometimes he allows us to see the way he works. And I was told that Kelvin Cochran was going to be speaking at an event that was being held in uh, coastal Georgia. It was hosted by the Family Research Council and First Liberty Institute, and Kelvin Cochran uh, was scheduled to speak, (laughs) someone that I had read about, who his story had encouraged me. I'd listened to podcasts, watched videos, hearing him tell his testimony, and I was just so encouraged that he had already taken a stand here in my home state of Georgia, and he won. And to have him come to uh, my event 
was just such a blessing, and to have him on the show was a blessing as well. I so hope that you were blessed by it. He mentioned a couple stories of Bible characters who God restored a hundredfold after they experienced persecution. And he mentioned Joseph, and um, recently I've been reading the, the story of Joseph, even before I had Kelvin on the, the show. What really struck me recently was Joseph naming his children. If you're if you're not familiar with the story of Joseph, I highly encourage you to go read the later parts of the book of Genesis and just read that story. Honestly, you can read it all in one setting. It's it's very captivating. It's it's very interesting. And Joseph was one of twelve sons born to Jacob, one of the three patriarchs of ancient Israel. And Joseph was uh, the second youngest. He had a younger brother named Benjamin. And uh, Joseph, as a young man, had dreams that basically, in effect, that his family would would bow to him one day. And I, I believe Bible scholars say Joseph was probably about 17 or 18 around this time. He was a young man, and he would tell his brothers, and he would tell his father. And, you know, there's a, there's a sense that, you know, maybe Joseph came off as a little arrogant as a young man telling this to his brothers and his brothers didn't like him. And so his brothers were going to kill him, but instead they sold him as a slave to a man named Potiphar, who was a high ranking official in Egypt under Pharaoh. And so Joseph was taken away to uh, Egypt as a slave, but God was with Joseph and I could go through the whole story, but I I, I don't want to spoil it. Joseph eventually was placed in a high position and you can read the, of how that worked out, but, but when Joseph had two sons, he remembered God's faithfulness through all his suffering, through all his hardship, through all his persecution. And in Genesis 41, verses 50 through 52, we read this, Two sons were born to Joseph before the years of famine arrived. Asenath, the daughter of Potiphera, priest at On, bore them to him. Joseph named the firstborn Manasseh and said, God has made me forget all my hardship and my whole family. And the second son he named Ephraim and said, God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. We read in the New Testament, those who love God and are loved by God, no matter what happens to them, God always works things for their good. Joseph was sold as a slave. And when you read his story, you'll see hardship after hardship after hardship. Joseph experienced these things in spite of the fact that he was doing good. Joseph didn't deserve all that he went through. Sure, he may have been a little arrogant as a, as a child, but when he went to Egypt, there were things that happened to him that he did not deserve. He was doing really well. He was treated unfairly. And yet, Joseph didn't allow that to make him better. Instead, Joseph looked to God and said, after all this affliction, Manasseh, Ephraim. It's as if all this hardship on, on me and my family never happened. God has blessed me so much. God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. Instead of challenging God on the basis of fairness, Joseph looked to God with a heart of gratitude and thanksgiving. God allowed Joseph to become a slave and prisoner to teach him the value of servanthood and reliance on God. The best leaders are first servants. I've recently been reading accounts of by uh, General Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain at Gettysburg. He commanded the 20th Maine on Little Round Top. And one quote that hit me, he said, right before battle, he said to himself, if the worst is coming, let us meet it. 
Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain was a Christian. No matter what comes our way, let us meet it because we know that we're in the hands of God, the one who sees all, controls all, knows all. We have nothing to fear. God is in control, and God works all things out for the good of those that love him. I hope this episode blesses you and encourages you. If you're in the middle of a trial or if you experience a trial or persecution, never forget, you are not alone. You are not forsaken. At Real Jacob Kersey on the socials. We'll see you back next week on the podcast.